During the ride home, I looked into my rearview mirror and noticed the same blue van had been behind me since I pulled out of the hospital parking lot. I didn't concern myself until after enough turns, I realized it was still following me. Couldn't be, I thought. I, I really can't handle any more stress now. Perhaps I'm becoming paranoid, I scolded myself. I looked again and mentally copied down the license plate number just in case. I decided that I would change the way I usually went home and started to take other old familiar roads hoping the van just happened to be someone going my way and not intentionally following me. But no matter where I turned, the van was still right behind me. He was following me. There was no doubt about that now. I slowed down a little bit to see if I could make out the driver's face, but he was too far away. I could only see that it was a man in a baseball cap. This time, I didn't even think twice about what to do. I knew that I didn't want to go straight home, so I headed toward my local police station. As I drove, the van continued right along behind me, keeping a safe distance, but when I made a right into the police station, instead of climbing the steep hill to my house, the van quickly veered left and drove out of sight, speeding away in the opposite direction. I sat there for a moment and breathed a sigh of relief. My knees felt unsure as I descended a few steps into the police department that was housed in the basement of the borough's municipal building. In a town that is only one square mile and has little over 1,200 residential homes, it was hard to be invisible. I was sure that word had gone around town about the incident with Jennings inside the house that night in my bloody lips, so it was... Uh, with a mixture of caution and maybe embarrassment that I entered the doors and asked to speak to someone. The detective in charge came out and filed a report on the incident. He didn't seem to think that I was crazy, or at least if he did, he hid it well. He promised to follow up as soon as possible and get back to me if he found out anything. An officer followed me home, and after checking around the house, he said he would patrol the area several times a day until his superior had news about the driver of the van. Ugh, what else could happen? I tried not to show my fear in front of the children, but this time I really was being pushed over the edge. I just didn't know how much more I could stand. But the biggest weight that I bore was the concern of what all this was doing to my little children. A few hours later, the phone rang. The detective had found out who was following me, and my husband was responsible. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So many questions were swirling around in my head as I hung up the phone. I stood there momentarily, just staring at nothing. When my eyes focused on a wire leading from the telephone and running directly into the bottom of the refrigerator through the grill. It was pushed out at a slight angle. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. I got down on my knees and tried to pry open the grill. Oh, it came off easily, and I bent my head down to see if I could tell what was attached to the wire. I reached my hand under the refrigerator and pulled out a device of some kind. I saw it was a tape recorder. I was both outraged and frightened. This had to be the work of a very sick man. First, the shock of finding out that Jennings had hired someone to follow me and then to wonder how long had that thing been down there recording my conversations. He was still convinced that I was seeing someone and he'd been having me followed every time I left the house. I mean, how could I have been so blind not to see? It was just a coincidence that I looked into the rearview mirror at the night time, or at the right time. Who was this crazy, paranoid being 
who took over my husband's body. These final discoveries were the breaking point for me. I just couldn't take it any longer. The mountain finally crumbled. I knelt there, my body refusing to release the pain welling up inside of me. The anger that had been bottled up for so long refused to be released. There I was, on my knees, trembling, so deeply immersed in my pain that I didn't see my young son come up behind me. It was not until he wrapped his little arms around my head to comfort me that I even realized he was there. I turned and held him in my arms. Mommy's okay, I assured him. Honestly, I, I, I didn't know what to do next. I knew I couldn't stay with my husband. After the discovery of the recorder, I was determined that I would no longer be his victim and I had to protect myself as well as my family, no matter the cost. I replaced the device the best I could, the way I found it. I was afraid of my husband and I didn't want him to know that I was on to him. It wasn't time yet. I had to think about it and have my plan set as to what I was going to do. My mind started framing my moves as, as if maneuvering in a game of chess. I knew it wouldn't be too long before the man in the van would have to confront my husband with the fact that he had been caught. I was counting on the driver being afraid to tell him right away and that he had confessed to the police and had implicated him. If so, we would be safe for maybe a little while longer. Jennings had been his most powerful player in his game with me, and I had to bring him into checkmate before it was too late. The next day after Jennings went to work and the children were at school, I drove to a peaceful wooded park near our house. I've always loved the outdoors and when I am around nature, my head clears and I can think better. Maybe it's the connection with things that are given life over and over again, a, a new chance to grow taller or blossom more beautifully, to fly about the universe with untethered wings. Who knows? I parked my car and strolled down toward the bridle path my children and I often took, then wound around through the trees. Oh, it was so peaceful. I picked up a strong, straight branch from the ground that begged for walking, broke off the weak side branches and used it to support my steps on the frozen ground. The dirt was dimpled with rivets where horses' hooves had tattooed the ground earlier. As I made my way through the naked trees, I began to relax a little. I could hear the birds above me singing their winter songs. I wrapped my muffler around my neck a little more securely and continued along the trail until I came out into a clearing. I could feel the short grass crunch beneath my feet, dry from the winter's cold, and I found a log at the edge of the clearing that had weathered the abuses of hooves, not clearing its girth. I sat on the battered old log and looked out over the expanse before me, and, and I thought about my life for a long while. I thought about all the years with Jennings, the happy times, the darker times, the trauma I had gone through with him, giving up the career that I loved. All of this seemed so surreal as if it belonged to someone else's life, not mine. It couldn't belong to the little girl from Ohio with big dreams for her life. I recalled reading something written by Eleanor Roosevelt I'd read during the time I lived in New York. She wrote that we gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, you know, 
I live through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing you cannot do. That passage never had so much relevance to me as it did while sitting on that log on that particular clear winter's day. I got up from my comfortable resting spot and continued to walk across the clearing and took the trail that doubled back to where I had started. I walked up the grassy slope to my car and drove home, still not able to see my future. It seemed strange to me, but in spite of all that had happened in the past few months, I found myself with a very bizarre sense of freedom and power that I hadn't felt in a long time. I now only had one demon to exercise from my life, my husband. I had to face the painful truth that Jennings and my stalker were one in the same. Powered by his paranoia, his schizophrenia, it had been Jennings all those years. I knew what I had to do. I prayed that God would give me the strength. I have since learned being married to a paranoid schizophrenic for so many years, I had eventually become a perfect example of cognitive neo-association. Trauma and violence I had experienced in my life with Jennings obliterated my other mental functions, rendering me unable to concentrate on anything but the images of dysfunction in my life. During those years of extreme stress, I was subject to a ne neurological numbness by the things that were happening to me. And although I appeared to be functioning on a normal lever, on the surface, internally, I could not see things as they really were. To paraphrase Woodrow Wilson on his comment after viewing D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, my reaction to the events in my life is similar. When I say that putting my memories of Jennings down on paper is like writing with lightning, and my only regret is that is, it is all so terribly true. It took me a long time to admit defeat. It was hard for me to accept failure, but the time had come in my marriage the point at which I knew I would have to stop beating my head against a brick wall. I had to let go, but I knew Jennings would be not so willing as to let me freely walk out of his life alive. My fate was in the hands of the higher force to show me the way. I didn't have to wait long. It came that evening. Up to this point, Jennings had suspected nothing. Evidently, the van driver never confessed to Jennings that he had even been caught following me. As far as my husband knew, I was completely in the dark. The girls were sleeping over at a friend's house that evening, so after dinner, I took over their chores by clearing the table and cleaning the kitchen. I gave my son a bath, put him to bed a hard task now that he was growing up and being scrubbed clean in a bathtub wasn't a priority. I thought about how quickly the years had flown away from me, the dragon of time belching flames, burning away the years. Jennings was watching the news and I excused myself and went to bed. I replayed in my mind for a hundredth time my plans to escape tomorrow escaped back to my parents' home in Ohio. Just as I was about to fall into a deep sleep, I felt Jennings's hot breath against my face, accusing, 
rambling words came from deep within his throat, accusing me of the worst acts of infidelity in incoherent sentences. He grabbed my arm and twisted it behind my back, and I couldn't move. I, I screamed for him to let me go. I tried to struggle and free myself from beneath his body, but to no avail. I knew I was going to die, but I was not to go without a fight. Then just as quickly as he attacked me, he released me and turned and walked away. He moved across the room toward the doors to th as if to leave, and then he suddenly turned around and lunged at me on the bed, his powerful six-foot muscular body ready to crush the life out of me. Looking back, I can't imagine the part of my being that overtook my body that last night with Jennings. I've never seen her again, ever. But this force within me, this instinct for survival, gave me the strength to fight back as I had never fought before. My repressed anger surfaced, and all of the primal instinct of survival were armed against my predator. The stories I had reported as an anchor woman, headlines that I had read so objectively about domestic violence and murder, this one won't have my name on it. I would no longer be a victim. He had used my compassion against me, and I played right into his hands. I couldn't take it anymore. I wouldn't take it anymore. I wouldn't back down. I had to stand up to him and pay the price no matter the cost. I quickly rolled from the edge of the bed onto the floor. My adrenaline was raging. I ran out of the room to my son's bedroom down the hall and quickly locked the door behind me. I had little time before Jennings would come after me. I barricaded the door by sliding a dresser in front of it. My heart was racing, but somehow I was able to dial for help. I sat down in the rocking chair next to my son's bed. He was sleeping peacefully, and the cadence of his breathing quieted my mind. I had cornered myself and was easy prey for my hunter. There were no options. I sat in silence, made peace with God, and waited. Jennings never came. When the police arrived, he was sitting quietly and gave no resistance. Only God knows. But he did give me the strength to protect myself and save me from being killed that night. I didn't press charges and the police convinced Jennings to commit himself to a psychiatric hospital for treatment. Jennings was in the acute stages of schizophrenia, and jail was not the answer. I wish I could say that this is the end of the story and that Jennings got well and that we lived happily ever after, but it was too late. It was not meant to be. When he was allowed visitors, I went to see Jennings in the hospital we sat in his sparsely furnished room, husband and wife, at the end of our journey together. You know, I really don't belong here, he said, bending close to me in what almost seemed to whisper. Then he hissed, You're the guilty one. You can tell me the truth now. They can't hear. He got up and walked over to the wall and proudly show me where he had stuffed a sheet of stationery over the intercom in his room. When he turned to look at me, there were tears in his eyes. You know, I love you so much. I can't live without you. And he fell to his knees in front of me and looked up. If I can't have you, no one will. With these words, a macabre sense of pity for him overcame me. Jennings had been a part of me so long. I had caressed his handsome face, laid next to his strong body, 
but the eye of his mind was beyond my grasp, locked away somewhere foreign to me. I knew his face, I knew his body, but I didn't know his mind. Perhaps even for him, on his more lucid days, his thought processes that traveled far beyond the reaches of comprehension remained a deep, dark, and impenetrable mystery. I longed to know the why of it all, but there was no why. It just was. I had to accept it. I never went back. During the months he was in treatment, he escaped several times and returned toward the house, but luckily his absence at the hospital was discovered in time for him to be picked up and returned behind locked doors until he was well enough to be discharged. Finally propelled by his schizophrenia, Jennings was convinced that he was all those things he created in his mind. Possessing the advantage of being quite handsome and dripping with charisma, his behavior was intact and not all bizarre to those that initially met him. This outside reaction only fortified his convictions of his own truths about his sanity. On January 22, 1980, just about three years after my divorce from Jennings was final, I received a phone call from the state police in Tionesta, Pennsylvania. Jennings was missing and was believed to have been murdered in his home in the mountains nearby. Had I seen him, they asked. No, I said. Not for a few days now. His car was in his driveway at his home in Marionville. There were no bloodstains on the soil around his property, but there were wide truck tire imprints on the ground near the house. Loose change and his keys were found scattered on the ground between his house and the garage, as though expelled from the torn pockets in a struggle. His suitcase was still unpacked, sitting on the table where he had placed it after coming home from a visit to Pittsburgh. I didn't cry. In my heart, the man that I loved and married died a long time ago. I could not mourn for this man. He was a stranger to me. With that single phone call, it was as though a heavy weight had been lifted from my body. I was free, free, I was free to live and have a life again without fear, free to walk the world again with my children without restrictions. And Jennings was finally free, released from his earthly imprisonment to go on to something more peaceful. I only hoped he didn't suffer. My thoughts flashed back to that earlier time when Jennings proudly hovered over his dying conquest and let its blood spill out into the snow. The hunter had become the hunted. The Pennsylvania State Police investigators keep in touch with me year after year. Once they had found a body in the woods near Marion and they wanted me to send him them dental records, I did. It wasn't him. It has been over 38 years since I received that first phone call, and every year since, I get a call from the Missing Persons Division of the Pennsylvania State Police asking if I have seen Jennings, routine procedure that has to be followed. When I now think of Jennings, I can cry. I have great compassion for the depth of pain Jennings himself must have endured through his eyes in his own drama he was the victim in 1972 I interviewed the great violinist Rubinoff 
Will Rogers had been a good friend of his, and as a token of their friendship, Will gave Rubinoff a watch, engraved with thoughts he shared with me. The core thinking of what was engraved on the watch is that we go around but once in this life, and we had better enjoy every minute of it while we can, because we don't know and we don't have the knowledge to know when our time here is over. Little did I dream at the time that this passing observation Rubinoff and I discussed would become an anchor to me in the hardest of times. It still today embodies much of what I believe about life. So, in the end, neither my plan nor Jennings's plan were the ones mapped out for our lives. There was a more compelling road map charted for our journeys and our trip ticket. Didn't matter. But through all of the hills and valleys in my life so far, of one thing I am certain, it is never too late to change your life for the better and to shed old skin, old habits, old addictions. If you have the strength to close one door behind you and open another, a better life is waiting for you on the other side, right here and right now. No matter how frightening it is to think of starting over and beginning a new journey in your life, the rewards for taking those steps forward are greater than one can imagine. I know, because I've been there and I've been given another chance to get it right this time. This is Sandra Hart saying adieu. I hope you've enjoyed my story behind the magic mirror. I have written another book that details the investigation that I made. I went back to Marion with my husband, Arthur, and I investigated Jennings's murder, and I solved the mystery of what happened to my husband in Behind the Magic Mirror, Part 1 and Part 2. Have a good day. And thank you for coming along with me on this journey. Welcome here. Our hearts been taken hostage by the sweetest little deer.